Uh, hi, welcome to everyone to this panel. Thank you to REI for putting this together. Uh, it's, you know, thank you for my co-panelists for taking the time uh, to come in and, and speak about this topic, which I'm sure a lot of people are really keen to understand more about. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a very interesting six months or eight months, I would think, as a, as a globe. Uh, while there have been some challenges, I think there have been a lot of things that have become strengths as a result of us being, uh, you know, a part of this, this entire pandemic um, situation. Uh, there were a lot of changes that were coming forth even prior to this, but I think there was an acceleration of how we now started to look at all the various human processes uh, within our businesses. Uh, you know, as you just heard the previous presentation, I think one of the challenges was that work from home was going to become reality. We still needed people who could do the job. Uh, we still needed people who could make sure that, um, um, that, that they knew what they were delivering from a consumer standpoint. And genuinely, I think retail is one of the businesses that's probably the most impacted today by this whole work from home culture. So while a lot of tech can actually move away and you know do the whole work from home, for retail, it was like unlearning and relearning. Um, and one of the biggest impacts was the learning platforms. Um, so today we're going to talk a lot about uh, what virtual learning really means. Uh, you know, how, what are the, the good points and the bad points of it? How do you really create that change? Uh, and, you know, how do you measure the ROI? One of the questions that's always plagued, uh, I think, human resources when it comes down to uh, putting money behind training. Uh, and with further ado, I'm going to get into the panel. Um, thank you so much to everyone to, you know, for us, for joining us this evening. Um, let's first just delve into what is the need uh, for the virtual learning programs. I'm going to pass that question to Nandini. Nandini, a lot of your business, obviously, you've seen it, you know, kind of open up part by part. Uh, let's talk about what do you think is the need for why uh, we need virtual learning systems? Yeah, thank you so much, Seema, for that. And thank you to RAI for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. And just to answer your question, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot that's been happening in the space of learning, you know, with the age old style of, in, you know, the instructor led training to e-learning, to immersive and blended learning. And then uh, we moved on to integrating a learning with talent management and, uh, you know, so, so it has been evolving. And then, of course, virtual learning. And now the latest, you know, the talk is about how do we have learning as a flow in the work, right? So it should be integrated with your work. So uh, especially considering the current situation of the pandemic and uh, COVID, well, I don't want to really touch upon that because everywhere we are talking only about it, but that's the need of the R. And I think... Uh, it has opened up a lot for everyone uh, in HR and learning in terms of how do we engage our employees in this particular time when everybody is working from home. So I think uh, the entire need for virtual learning increased at this point in time, especially for us being in retail, having 80% of our employees in the front end. And, uh, you know, wondering how to connect with them because uh, stores were not open. So when the pandemic started, we were all a little worried about what are we going to do? So in Landmark, uh, you know, last year in Max, we started this whole initiative of, uh, uh, you know, uh, having a learning management system for the front end, which was an app based uh, tool, which I had spoken about yesterday. And, uh, you know, in lifestyle and home center, we really didn't have that tool. So I moved into this role in March and we were struggling as to what do we do. And thanks to RAI again, because uh, that's when train came to our help, the train app. And we did a lot of our training interventions virtually for our front end. And it actually helped us keep them engaged and also to sharpen the saw for them in terms of customer service, selling skills, product knowledge, cross concept knowledge, you know, normally, uh, you know, the front end staff are only focused in, on one concept. So this helped us, you know, improving their skills on other concepts as well. So I think the virtual learning platform really helped us there. 
And I think that was the need of the hour and it is going to continue to be the need of the hour because we are looking at how do we make uh, employees more fungible? How do we look at employees handling multiple roles? And if you're going to do that, virtual learning is going to become a critical uh, tool. So we introduced that and for our corporate and regional office employees, we already had a learning platform and uh, we, we just added courses to that based on the requirement. We also used MS Teams extensively to do certain interventions where it required for us to have some face-to-face -face interventions with them. So I think overall it has really, really helped us. And uh, like I told you in the current uh, scenario, I think for at least another six months, the scenario is not going to change and virtual learning becomes very, very critical because we're not going to have all our employees under one roof for a training intervention. And this is definitely going to help. And I see that earlier we used to struggle in ensuring coverage on a you know, virtual platform or on a e-learning platform. But today we see that you know, the coverage is almost close to 100%. You know, everybody is utilizing their time to learn and you know, upskill themselves. And uh, I think it is the right time for the learning and development team to look at how do we come about with various interventions which can help people uh, to develop themselves at this point in time so they're able to contribute better uh, once things get back to normal. So I think that that's the take from me. Thank you so much, Nandini. And, and uh, so the points that I'm really picking up that you said broadly was the first one being around engaging our employees usefully uh, as, they're, you know, as, as they kind of move in the business. Um, we will always have to have a learning management system that helps the engagement stay up. Um, sharpening the saw, I think that's another critical one that uh, helps us and why virtual learning became critical during this period. And I think moving forward, the one thing I heard you say was more a productivity conversation, which is on how do you make employees more fungible and how do we make them more multi-skilled and multi-talented to be able to deliver a lot more. Absolutely. All right. Um, so thank you for that, Nandini. And with that, we'll move to the next question. Now, um, essentially, you know, everyone agrees that with something gained, there is always something lost. Uh, we're going to go through first to understand that as we see change, uh, what are the gains that have come out of us being able to adapt to the virtual uh, learning system? Um, Jeeva, you as the first responder, and I think you were retail's first responder to the pandemic, right? Because grocery never shut down. We always had it uh, there. Um, you know, how did you use it effectively? Because you still had to make sure that your people delivered in a completely unknown environment. Uh, you know, you, they were not used to doing the home delivery uh, today when you look at it outside. Uh, you know, and I was talking to a friend actually uh, in, in Australia and, and she was asking me about how do I get something delivered to my mom who's unwell uh, in India. And she could actually use an app sitting in Australia to deliver something to her mom in, in India. Uh, which she couldn't do in Australia itself. So she's tried ordering for herself and she couldn't do it. So, you know, we've obviously made this transition really quickly. So Jeeva, you want to tell us how you've used the virtual learning platforms to be able to get quick results in terms of, uh, you know, the changes that had to be adapted to. Yeah, thank you, Sima. Thank you for mentioning about uh, the app experience. Uh, thanks to GeoMark. Um, so uh, we, 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 you talked about uh, adaptability, and um, and we work for Reliance. Reliance is known for agility and adaptability. That's why that's how we see it, right? So uh, <clears throat> so we are quick to uh, adapt. We think and do the same at the same time. That's how we are tuned. Um, so one of the thing is like you no, know, like uh, COVID uh, um, uh, brought us into a very bad situation. It's a pandemic situation. So uh, the only business which was running is grocery. And we need to serve our employees and, and our customers. So uh, grocery business was up and running and it was uh, functional and operational. So um, suddenly um, we adopted, quickly adopted to home delivery. So that's where the Geomart uh, story is all about. So Geomart suddenly uh, it become popular and we have to, uh, we started delivering uh, uh, merchandise grocery to our customers. Uh, so how it is possible, and at the same time, I must compliment and appreciate our associates who ventured out uh, in this pandemic situation. Uh, they risked their, risked their life and then coming to our stores. 
and uh, hats up to them. Uh, thank you so much for them. Uh, each one of them had demonstrated that courage and affinity and ownership to the company. Um, so uh, obviously, when we are talking about uh, home delivery, uh, it means new capabilities and new additional manpower. And we should also make sure that uh, the business continuity is important. So, um, so, so we have to keep uh, one group of people at home and then one group of people who are coming to work so that uh, they, they, we, we take care of their well-being as well. So um, what happened, so we need to uh, augment our manpower also. So we augmented our manpower, one side. The other side is we need to build capabilities. When I'm talking about capabilities, it's all about democratizing capabilities. So there is a new set of capabilities which are not there. We are not known uh, for our e-commerce. We are not an e-commerce company. And uh, there are certain new capabilities like picking, packing, home delivery, customer service, virtual customer service. These are all new capabilities. Obviously, we have to develop new capabilities in a, in a virtual environment. Second thing is nurturing existing capabilities. That's another thing. And the third one is, as I told you, we augmented uh, manpower capacity. So that means we have to utilize our manpower uh, from other uh, formats which were closed due to lockdown, like trends and uh, digital. So we use them. So those who are selling mobile phones till the previous day, next day they were in a grocery format. That's a, that's a drastic change. And they were able to quickly adopt this. And uh, that's why you know, our, our learning platform, one is our learning platform and, and our infrastructure and our IT uh, platform, IT support. The second thing is how we are helping them to learn faster. Um, um, while I'm, while we're talking about app-based learning or even LMS-based learning, e-learning, uh, I should not miss out WhatsApp University. Okay, that's a very popular university these days. So WhatsApp University is, uh, is, is, is one thing which really helped us to quickly make some small videos, micro learning videos, and then upload it so that now everyone is in WhatsApp. And all our employees, the entire ecosystem, more than 100,000 people, they were able to quickly adopt this and learn this. So we use extensively our own uh, GeoMate platform. Just again, thanks to COVID. So we have a GeoMate platform like uh, Zoom or MS Teams. That helped a lot to connect with people. So virtually instructed learn training programs. So, so VILT, um, we had more than um, uh, 9.84 uh, non-unique users who were adopted to this uh, VILT training programs. It is a blend of I mean, classroom and virtual instructed learn uh, training program. So it is not only about e-learning models, we also help them to um, uh, clear their doubts. And there are a lot of performance support tools. Um, um, we used um, MS Teams, MS Team Forms, and the manager coaching, train the trainer. So it is not a one size, I mean, I, I'm sure, I mean, you will also agree with me, there is no one size fits all approach. So we use multiple platforms, all the available platforms to make sure that our employees are well-trained and uh, capable enough to serve the last mail customer. I think that's a big thing. And uh, learning on the go was quickly, uh, we were able to adopt, we were able to implement. And um, in addition to this, our corporate employees, um, we upskill them a lot and then reskill. A lot of new merchandisers, uh, they reskill. It's all category agnostic. We introduced a program called um, um, Crossface. Uh, Crossways is like, no. So if I'm a, a particular merchandiser handling a particular category, I have the ability, I have an opportunity to learn something else. So that's an opportunity so that no, that we, they, we utilize this time period to upskill and reskill our uh, corporate resources as well. Uh, that's a great journey. And um, yeah, so over to you. Uh, so. Thank you, Jeeva. I think uh, you're right. I mean, you know, hats off to all the, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees who actually put their lives in danger and were actually essential. And I'm sure everyone remembers how difficult it was, uh, you know, having 20 year old kids actually going out there. And I remember when I saw, you know, I was talking to a lot of the McDonald's employees um, and a lot of them said that my parents are okay with me coming to work because I'm doing something good for society. Um, so I think all of us should give them a major, major shout out. Uh, but Jeeva, thank you. So what I heard you say was one of the biggest things uh, virtual learning aids is adaptability. So because we're in this process of, of virtual learning, uh, you're able to adapt or build new capabilities, not just for your existing business, but also to be able to launch new businesses. So someone like Reliance has actually gone out and launched a complete e-commerce platform during this period without even meeting people once. Um, the other piece I did here was you were able to utilize a lot of the other play people and be able to staff up 
for the business that was working. Um, so the speed at which you could reskill people was exceedingly high. Uh, and the third one was they, they gave you a lot of performance support tools. I think all three things was what I heard you saying was what was gained. Um, now, when you look at it, you know, with every gain, there's always a trade-off. Um, and I think one has to be very, very aware of the trade-off that kind of happens with any change. Um, Dr. Sanjeev, I'm going to pull you in in this one. Um, you know, and, and I know you and I are a little bit on the old school uh, thinking where we do believe that having a face and a name to the person who's teaching you becomes really critical. Uh, what in your mind are things that we're going to lose if we move to completely virtual learning platforms? Dr. Sanjeev? Thanks, Seema. Yeah. yeah, yeah. thanks, Seema, uh, uh, for giving me an opportunity for sharing my thoughts on the third off or what is missing in this virtual learning. Thanks for Rai for giving this virtual platform to discuss the virtual training. See, uh, when you see retrospectively after the you know the outbreak of the pandemic, one of the biggest shift during this new normal was forced work from home. All of us know. On which I you know on the lighter side I say corporate open house arrest, right? So the the byproducts of this work from home working or the virtual working is the spread of necessity of e-learning, virtual learning, digital learning on on all LMS platforms across all corporates, but. This new transformation of the virtual learning can be decoded with some favorable as well as flip side of understanding by me. I'll be very frank on this. See, during the national uh, lockdown, what has happened, you know, we like all other corporates started engaging employees with the virtual training tools, so-called Zoom learning sessions, in-house external professional trainers, we were, you know, the pioneers in shifting our corporate front, front and staff to the train circle, right? And the initial feedback and the participation of the front and staff was very encouraging. But at this virtual, you know, the session went up gradually, the people started losing interest. And you can see the, the participation also went line. And when you see also the interest and the enthusiasm among the employees also started going down. So they were, you know, fed up with this only one kind of working on the virtual platforms. As these virtual learning interventions were new and different, everyone was finding it very efficient. Somebody was telling they were geographically accessible. Now everything is affordable. It is very cost effective. With maximum attendance you can do with the least cost. Everything was happening. But this corporates also found out apart from virtual learning, the virtual employees also the need of the hour, which every organization were trying to do to keep their employees engaged. I was, you know, see some corporates also introduced, you know, the virtual pizza party on Zooms, uh, you know, virtual annual days, virtual, you know, the annual ceremonies and other virtual employee engagement sessions. But we were also the part of this virtual uh, journey. Now, Seema, what, what I have seen is that you see on the other part of the reality, or I see on the flipper side, or see on the key challenge on this virtual interventions during this virtual training or learning, what you call it. See, employees are not able to focus on the screen after some time. You all know, even, even if I see even kids doing e-learning at my house, uh, my neighbor's house, I see the people are not able to sit, mothers are catching them and making them to sit on the screen and they are all distracted and not, they're looking everywhere except screen. This is what naturally happens. Then you see the technological issues, even in during our sessions, although last time we have lost that contact and the connect due to the internet connectivity issues, that is also there. Then this continuous back-to-back -back Zoom calling, e-learning, which also has a sense of you know, isolation among the employees. The human element, or we call it as the team connect, or the interpersonal synergy is missing on these virtual platforms. So to conclude this, I will firmly say that virtual training has to be complement, or it can be an extension of a classroom training. But Virtual training will always struggle to be a replacement or a substitution of a classroom training. That is my personal view. And we should also, you know, think about something like a hybrid model on which you can have a best ROI and learning efficacy. Cool. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev. I think uh, the points that I captured, which I think all of us resonate really with, is, uh, you know, sustaining interest and participation beyond a certain point becomes a challenge if you go with the virtual learning platform only. 
um, while there is a need for it, uh, there is also a cost to it. When you look at the connectivity, you look at devices, you look at space, uh, you know, just getting a corner of the house where it's quiet in, you know, cities like the metros is, is normally going to be hard. Um, and I think the third part, which I think is the most critical, is the human element when it comes down to being able to ensure that the teaching is complete. That part actually becomes the biggest challenge. Um, so, you know, that I think those are very, very important points and, and stuff that we should keep in mind as we're building our virtual training programs. So thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, you know, moving on from the fact that we've understood there's a need, we've understood there's gain and pain, uh, what exactly do you think is the uh, value proposition uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that our employees are able to adapt to these virtual training systems? Um, I think I'm going to go to Sutanu and uh, check with him as to what did they do at Spencer's that actually helped them to build this value proposition on virtual uh, training with their employees. Uh, Sutanu, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Seema. Uh I think as uh, Jiva mentioned, uh, we are also in the space of essential services. And, uh, and and as you mentioned, I think the change was so instant, you know, uh, for all of us, uh, you know, suddenly to get into a lockdown situation. And uh, so uh, I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely uh, credit to the employees, uh, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to risk uh, their lives. And I remember one uh, story, I mean, because I had joined recently, but this happened somewhere around uh, May, where a lady team leader uh, somewhere in Vizac, she actually uh, cycled 10 kilometers every day uh, because the store manager could not come because he was stuck in his hometown. And he came and she came and actually opened the store. Uh, and, and uh, you know, she would cycle every day 10 kilometers uh, both ways. And I think they were the superheroes uh, for us, uh, so there were there were two challenges uh, specifically, and and since you talked about the employee, you know the employee and what value proposition. One was obviously when uh, our model changed to an out of store model, uh, which where you know while the the consumer could not come in the initial days, we had to reach uh, to the consumer, uh, you know whether through home delivery or through RWAs, which is the resident welfare associations is at the so we had to set up basically quickly uh, and scale up the uh, call center because uh, you know uh, when we uh, when we told the customers uh, they and, and the number you know uh, was flooded with yeah a huge number of you know calls so the first thing was actually to scale up and train the uh, uh, the call center you know to understand what products uh, the customers are kind of you know uh, 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 ordering through the system. So that was the first uh, challenge. And the other challenge was, you know, how do, you know, th these out of store models quickly scaled up and, you know, where the product is actually going out into the, into the uh, customer's homes. So uh, we had actually an LMS system, a learning management system, which was defunct. And I think this was a wonderful opportunity for us to, you know, uh, revive uh, the learning management system and what we did was we connected with our, uh, you know, our category guys, whether it is uh, Fresh who deals with, uh, you know, FNV, uh, fruits and vegetables or, you know, uh, fish and meat uh, and, and essential, you know, grocery, FMCG, etc. So uh, what we did in the LMS is created some bite-sized, you know, programs, uh, just like, you know, news in short, because as Dr. Sanjeev was mentioning, the attention span of our frontline is, is very, very less. So, so in the, in the one, one and a half months, we created these bite sized modules and we told them, please use videos as much as possible. And, uh, you know, the, the training obviously for the, uh, you know, for these people were at the store. So we use the LMS, but I also believe that it has to be a hybrid model. So what we did was, you know, for example, a training in fish and meat, we actually took the, the laptop was there in the fish and meat section and actually. Uh, the the uh, the content was there and the live thing was there so it was like a physical and digital so if i say digital model kind of uh, what we adopted through the lms uh, so so i think that worked beautiful but we were restricted because we had only uh, you know in my team i have only three regional training managers so the next challenge was how do we train the trainer so we got the store manager and the 
from the department managers to you know train them so that they are at the stores who can then you know uh, do a much more effective job in terms of uh, you know uh, doing uh, those kind of trainings we also uh, introduced couple of you know soft skills because um, many of the employees were actually doing home delivery so in terms of you know very simple things like good morning good evening you know to the customer and you know uh, some basic etiquettes uh, was was very essential to teach them during those uh, those days so i think i think uh, we also you know kind of introduced some uh, rewards and recognitions because these people really some of them adopted very fast and and were able to uh, you know uh, adopt to the virtual uh, mode uh, very very uh, well though they are you know class 10 12 pass outs you know most of our frontline uh, folks so that is that is a model which uh, you know worked i think we will definitely use that but not necessarily uh, there will be obviously a lot of because we are in the real business i mean retail you know is in the real business a lot of moments of truth uh, happens uh, so so we also uh, train people on customer you know uh, how do you basically resolve customer complaints so again you know small small epicues uh, etc which helped uh, also we converted to regional language because uh, you know at least you know when the training happened uh, because it's it's important uh, back in the home office yeah most of the employees were at home working and uh, they still are so uh, one of the things so while in my chat with uh, my head of marketing uh, we just came out uh, because you know from the training needs which we identified through the recent performance management management lot of people said we want to learn digital and e-commerce so so we came out uh, and, and google has lot of free courses so both of us we just quickly chatted and he's a subject matter expert in that and we came out with a 30 hour uh, digital course uh, with the help of google and uh, almost 100 people volunteered to do that so we have just started the course uh, about 3 weeks back and people are so excited so it's like 3 hours in a week uh, uh, and uh, and one one hour modules and uh, end of the course they will be actually given a dual certificate both you know from google and spencers so it's a, it's a you know joint branded certificate is what will i think what important is the mindset to go digital because uh, you know a large portion of business will be because if you see the consumer has you know moved so fast you know in these times and adopted digital uh, i guess more faster than companies i think uh, so so the whole endeavor is uh, you know have that model of physical and digital uh, uh, and i think you know make it very short and simple because i think the attention span is less so keep it you know uh, learning bites in short so so that's what we had done you know in terms of uh, responding to this uh, situation and take the best out of it so that's it from me good thank you so much uh, sitanu so the point i heard and i think the very critical factors when you're actually uh, building a value proposition for something like virtual learning uh, the first one is give them a purpose as to why they need to adapt to the new ways uh, so i think your example of the girl who actually cycles the 10 kilometers is is fantastic because that shows you that there was purpose in them wanting to come to work every day and also upgrading what they what they were doing um i think the other two pieces which i took away one was create a digital model uh keep it as close to the store as you can so that people are still physically able to connect with what is going on rather than keeping it everything in a zoom room or whatever you know it doesn't help um the sec and the third uh, third part is keep micro learning rather than making them large modules keep it as visual as you can uh helps people learn faster grasp faster um and i think the other point that i've really uh, picked up both in terms of the corporate office as well as from a uh trainer point of view is keep your trainers trained there is no point if you cannot pass the knowledge on to uh you know the trainers who are going to use these tools and the second one is give people what they are looking for rather than what we want to teach them so i think your google example was fantastic uh in terms of us being able to build a value proposition for people to use uh certain tools that we're talking about um so i think a lot of really good points to take away from uh what you had to share sitanu thank you so much uh you know moving on from the value proposition i think the last point that uh that's always bothered me when it comes down to digital transformation is managing the change right uh at the end of the day while we've put a process together we know what the ups and downs of it are 
we also know how to create the value proposition that physical engagement on ground to be able to make sure adaptation happens and i think uh, i'm going to go to vidisha on this one because i know at wells fund they worked across various models uh, to be able to create this engagement piece uh, vidisha can i request you to take us through what you've done in the change management piece as well as how have you evaluated the roi or the return on what you've spent absolutely i think um, you know great discussion really enjoying listening to all my co-panelists um, dr sanjeev jeeva shadanu nandini and great uh, you know summary by you seema and thanks to the audience for listening in and rai as well for having uh, me over so great question i think you know i think in in its flowed so beautifully that towards the end it's very important to you know be mindful of the fact that a plan is pretty much required any time you do a transformation so just like um, you know you would do a business strategy so a digital transformation or a learning transformation that you're looking in the organization is extremely important that you have a change management plan so um i'm going to share with the audience uh, through examples and five steps that has worked for us in wellspun uh, as to what we've done and with examples as to how we've managed to do it right so the first step step i think um, is is very obvious but i think uh, many times you know we kind of sometimes jump into the process too soon without having adequate preparation so for me, for me the first step is always to really prepare so uh, it's very important that you have a charter uh, in place uh, you need to know um, you know your charter um, so that it is definitely there in the open and it is laid out with a complete plan as to who needs to do what right it's very important to also identify who your stakeholders are you know what are the business uh, stakeholders who what is the governance structure that you have so for the coe team so we represent the coe the culture the center of excellence team it's very important to have a governance structure in place and and very important in the preparation step is to identify the risks that you could face right so in the prepare stage itself you know making a charter identifying your stakeholders having a robust governance structure and understanding your risk and identifying them that's the first step now the second thing um, so what what we did in wellspun we actually had a you know we went through a much longer process of actually preparing and having a plan in place looking at who the stakeholders are uh, deciding on a governance structure because in a coe model you need to work we represent the group so we need to work with several business uh, leaders and hr heads of different organization and what could the possible risks be once we had that plan sema it was then much easy to visualize what could go wrong what could be a stumbling block so that is the first step the second thing that we did is um we and you know like what shadanu said and what you just said that you know why are we doing what we're doing so what's the objective behind it you know so unless you have your objective clear it's impossible to um really head out on a mission so you don't know where to go right you have a plan but you don't know where to go so i think for us it was very important that you know why we really want to do this digital journey why is it important how does it fit into a larger organization strategy and as you are aware wellspun is a conglomerate so it's a 3 billion dollar company but it retail is one such business but i think for us the larger vision or the mission of the organization was that we need to move from a b2b to a b2c organization and to be able to do that you know one can not uh, you know deny the role that technology will play in that you know how do you really change your perspective to be a customer centric organization so we decided that that's really our core objective and once we decided that once you have an objective in place it becomes very easy to kind of map your um, second level stakeholders so of course your uh, stakeholders are your mds but who are your second level stakeholders become equally important as well so that's the second stage first is prepare have a plan the second step is you know define the objective start with the end in mind and the third one is is you know the roi piece that you spoke about is designing you know what do you really want to get out of this digital transformation whether it's launching of a learning management system or like you know people said micro learning videos or getting a personal learning cloud like a degree or upgrade upgrade or you know a skill soft so what's your content strategy what's your content plan so you need to design your content plan uh you need to then once you have your content plan ready you need to say that okay are we going to do all virtual are we going to do blended are we going to do one on one some are we going to do you know one to many uh, in some so what's your training plan so what's your content strategy what's your training plan um what's your communication strategy 
right? Because uh, many times, you know, uh, in HR, we get so excited about the event and the, uh, you know, and, and the entire program that we don't realize that you need to communicate, communicate and communicate more. There is really not enough of communication. So what's your communication plan? Are you going to do road shows? Are you going to do one-on-one -on -one conversation with the MDs? Are you going to do like a theater act to talk about the concept? What are you going to do? And finally, what's your measurement plan? So in the first year, what are you going to measure? Are you going to measure activation? Are you going to measure hours? Are you going to use, look at the kind of content? What really are you going to measure? So that's the third step. So prepare, define your objective, design is the third step. And finally, the fourth step is one of the most critical is really your building step. So if you're partnering with a learning partner here, uh, whether it's Skillsoft or Degreed or a grad or whoever it is, it's very important that you do enough and more um, UATs, you do enough prototypes, you do enough pilots before actually going all hog. So you need to have, take small bites, pilot it, prototype it, try, try it out. And so the building stage in the user acceptance testing phase involve your stakeholders. So a lot of times I've seen that LNOD folks and HR folks usually do it among their close groups, but it's very important at this moment that you involve your stakeholders, let them get a sense of what the pilot looks like, take their insights, take their inputs, and then move. So that's your fourth step. And for finally, the fifth step is when you launch a change initiative or a digital change initiative, it's very important that you again, live by your communication strategy, do your road shows. But, you know, once you launch it, you know, you've got to sustain it, you know, so it's great. A lot of times I've seen a lot of, lot of organization launch something and then it just goes down, you know, it goes down, the momentum goes down. So how do you keep that consistently? So you need to have a plan where you move from project management to program management, right? And you need to take your stakeholder all along with you, where you're listening to them, where you're taking their feedback, taking their suggestion, acting as a bridge between the stakeholder and the service provider, and also keeping your eye on the radar of the business objective that whatever I'm doing, am I getting closure to the metrics that I had set up, right? So I think that's my five steps for the audience today. So prepare define the objectives, design, you know, your entire strategy, whether it's communication, measurement or content, build, do your UATs, involve your stakeholders. And finally, once you launch, move from project management to program management. So that's how we did it, um, Seema. And I think, you know, uh, to share with you, <clears throat> we had never really had a le digital learning in Wellspun three years back. <clears throat> After we launched it, there was a lot of skepticism because, you know, the cost effectiveness of, uh, of course, was one big area to bring in the stakeholders saying that, hey, you know, it's going to save us a lot of time, money and resources. But I think the socialization involvement of theirs in the pilot phase was very important to be a success story because today we're sitting at an 88 uh, percent, you know, usage and during the COVID times, we hit almost 350% usage of our learning platform, which is completely digital. So I think it takes a lot. And uh, even though, you know, what the user finally sees is just a personal learning cloud, but as HR L&D folks, my suggestion would be to really have spend at least three to six months preparing, planning, mitigating risks, socializing, engaging with your stakeholders and have a sustenance plan in place as well. I hope I've been able to answer your question, Seema. Absolutely, Bidisha. I think uh, you've even summarized it for me. So it actually makes it perfect. Uh, but, you know, guys, I think I can't install, uh, you know, the one point that Bidisha made, which is really, really critical, is the whole part on taking your stakeholders with you. Uh, you know, we're not the users of the final end product. I think some of the times, uh, LNOD teams and HR teams tend to become very uh, protective around uh, the product and how we built it. Um, any technology product, the user acceptance testing that needs to be done at large scale levels, small scale levels, use your partners, use the guys who are actually using you. And I think this goes back to what Sutanu was also mentioning about the fact is give them what they need, not what you want to give. Um, so if you integrate a little bit of the parts of everything that you know all the panelists have said, um, I think Vidisha has just put it together really beautifully on how do we come up with a virtual learning pro platform and how do we ensure that it gets uh, uh, delivered through the organization along with delivering ROI. But I think uh, before I go to the audience questions, there's one question that's plaguing me uh, you know, beyond this. And I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each one of you to answer with only uh, maybe two to three words, not more than that. Um, because this is a topic that's really close to all our hearts as HR professionals. 
um the fear is always that with virtual platforms and programs coming in what's going to be the job of the hr and lnod people what do you each of you feel are the couple of skills that hr and lnod need to learn in order for us to make the transition to the virtual world so let's start off with uh, you know in the order that we started i guess nandini you want to go first sure seema so i think uh, you know it becomes very important to reskill ourselves as well because it's just about moving from a physical environment to a virtual environment so it becomes more important uh, to understand what is the best technology that would work right so mm -hmm. understanding of technology becomes critical uh, from a skill perspective the second thing is engagement still is a concern in the virtual world like what dr sanjeev was mentioning right mm -hmm. so it becomes important for the lnod uh, team to constantly look at how do we uh, build very engaging content okay. right and then how do we keep interacting with the employees to ensure that you know the content is being utilized and it becomes more critical for uh, lnod to become more to facilitate still continue facilitating but not in the physical sense more in the virtual world so i think that becomes very critical and the whole strategy around lnod would change right so how do we become more strategic partners in the lnod journey of an employee i think that becomes critical so there is i think a larger part of lnod hr would be how to reskill yourselves in looking at strategies that would work well in the virtual world rather than in the physical world come out of being facilitators and trainers to being more of tech tech, tech savvy uh, people who can connect with employees and still get the roi of you know lnod so i think broadly that's what would be the shift done thanks nandini uh, jeeva uh, seema uh, i'm going to ask you give me some more time not only two three words so uh, i would uh, <laughs> i'm connecting with the word uh, somebody said yesterday in uh, one of the session Uh, uh -huh. out of the box thinking so we need to have out of the box thinking that's what he said uh, i uh, i strongly believe that there are no boxes around us okay so so the boxes we build uh, is basically based on our past experience our assumptions uh, that only this person will do this job and people should be domain agnostic only retail guys will be able to do retail job so it's all these are all the you know uh, assumptions and the assumptions are made based on past experience that's how we built a uh, boundary around us that boundary needs to be broken so if i am talking about this um, i also uh, recall uh, when somebody said people are not um, useless they are useless that means what you know so we need to really uh, hr l and od um, uh, team should focus on developing their capabilities there are no death for uh, talent there is no war for talent uh, people are available talent is available we need to liberate the talent we are we are constructing them we are putting them in a box and then saying that no talent is not available so we need to liberate the talent uh, when the moment when we are saying liberating the talent it's all about one is meeting their aspirations everyone has an aspiration to grow and second is um, aspiration doesn't I mean help them to grow right we need to build their capabilities so building capabilities and the third one is we can't really build uh, build the capabilities without understanding the organization needs so the organization needs are also important so they it's, it's an intersection of you no know, uh, individual needs capabilities and uh, organization needs so all these things are put together i think hr and lnod's role is going to be a uh, little more different than doing a transactional lms administrator role to uh, kind of you no know, uh, having a tool or platform to assess the capabilities not competencies we need to move for, move away from competencies to capabilities how you are going to apply their knowledge and skills in in their uh, learning in the flow of work so that capabilities they need to have a mechanism to assess and then have a mechanism to develop it's a, it's a journey it's a very very hyper personalization journey so we need to create that hyper personalization journey so that no uh, people are there talent is there and they are utilized in better way i think that's how i want to summarize sure thank you so much eva uh, dr sanjeev Yes, yeah, Sima. I think my colleagues have already taken a lot of times, so I'll be very brief. Uh, see, uh, two things which I like to focus uh, that they need to develop. I think one is the people connect with the uh, changing generations, and second is I suggest that basically you know the storytelling 
for more uh, interactive learning. Wow, okay. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Dr. Yeah, Sanjeev. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, and with that, Chitanu. Yeah, uh, Simha, I'll be brief. Uh, so far, I think HR and L&D uh, professionals, you need to understand the changing business needs. Uh, look at both the consumer and the employee uh, needs. Uh, very, very, you know, important. Uh, use simple technology uh, to, to, you know, uh, ensure that the output is, uh, is great. And finally, I think deliver the ROI. I think these four are uh, what I feel is very, very important. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bidisha. So I think, uh, you know, gone are the days when we can say that I'm, I'm just a facilitator or I do content or I do LMS. I think it's very important that we, we, we should have um, LNOD and HR specialists who are able to do the entire talent management cycle. So your understanding of the entire talent management cycle rather than just being a training specialist is very important. And I think uh, I like what uh, Dr. Sanjeev said, you know, the human connect. So how do you build skills on that? So if you like coaching, I think there'll be a lot of conversations which are hyper-personalized like the IDP writing. So I think those mm -hmm. can never be replaced by, uh, you know, machines, you know, the human connect. So being a, playing a role of a coach, helping people write their own IDPs, um, you know, engaging with people at, you know, at a, at a, at a you know, emotional level. So, uh, you know, look, I think these could be some of the new skills that could uh, emerge uh, in the future. And I think for me, uh, one of the most important things would also be, which I think has been overlooked, is understanding of analytics and business numbers, because more and more as we become leaner and businesses, you know, are hard pressed for resources, it'll be important that you are able to clearly understand business numbers, establish what the business um, agenda is, what they're really try driving to change before you take up an, you know, initiative and say, Hi, hey, I will do it for you. So it's not going to be training is not going to be the solution of everything. You need to understand the business problem, partner with your stakeholder. So I think stakeholder management skills and understanding of business, uh, you know, dynamics is going to be very important uh, for the coming generations of L and O D H R. And and I think for me, the three things, Seema, that has always worked, irrespective of what profession you are, is you know to continue to learn always, uh, continue to unlearn as well, passionately, and then continue to relearn. So this is the mantra that I live by. And I think you know whether you're in H R, L and D, or whatever you're doing, I think if you have these three mantras, you will just uh, you will be okay. Thank you. Wow. Okay. So that was really well put. Uh, you know, in the audience questions, we had one question that said, will LNOD teams be irrelevant if uh, things become digital? I think the, that question has been answered many times over. Um, I think the need for LNOD teams to now be seen as actually that which is teams versus hyper specialist roles is now becoming more critical than ever. Um, you know, in, in, uh, my transition as I made it into the strategic uh, growth transformation consultant. One of the things I'm noticing with a lot of the smaller organizations is uh, a lot of processes got put in because they fell into the Ulrich employee life cycle. How they impacted business, whether they were the right decisions to be made, no one knows. You know, so a lot of the times I'm asking the question, but why would you do this? I don't know. You know, and, and nine times out of 10, when you look at smaller businesses, um, you see that a lot of it is driven by the promoter thinking who may not be a specialist. Um, so I think one of the things that people have to be able to understand, and I think all of you have said it, is this is business partnering in its true sense. You do need to understand the business. You need to tell a story and you need to be a partner. I think that's where the changes are going to come very heavily, both in terms of HR as well as in l &OT. Gone are the days where you just went in, facilitated, and got out. Um, so, yeah, thank you. There's a whole long list. Uh, you know, if I actually had to go back into that, it, it's going to take a really long time. Um, so thank you, everybody, so much. I think uh, we've been able to put together at least a broad framework for, I hope, our participants on what does it take as you build a virtual learning platform. Uh, just in the end, what I do want to do is take a question that's there from the audience. And I leave this open for anybody to uh, answer. Uh, how do you decide which is the best learning module or vendor when you are stretched for resources? And this is a question I remember uh, asking a really senior um, LND professional in Unilever when we were at about 
ten restaurants. You know, and I remember not getting a very satisfactory answer at that time because when you have the resources that probably each one of us has, it's a much easier decision. So, what would be advice from you know any of you guys on how do you really choose someone without it being just because it's cheap, but being because it's right? So, um, Seema, I'd like to answer that because I've sure, spent Manisha. almost eight years in Future Group, and now, and that's a promoter-driven company, and again in Wells mm -hmm. Fund, which is again, right. So, I think for me, um, to answer that question, what matters is really what you're setting out to achieve. You know, when you say the best digital learning module vendor, so what is it that you want to achieve uh, through getting this vendor is very important because sometimes the mistakes I've seen people say that, oh, everyone's doing, you know, Upgrad or Skillsoft or XYZ, let me just do that. But maybe that doesn't work for you. Probably what you need is just homemade videos, you know, for your frontline stuff and you don't need anything fancy. So I think if you start with the end in mind saying what you need to do and why you need to do it. And I would always say that start with, uh, for me, what's always worked is, you know, a deep interview with the learning vendor. And especially if they are smaller, you know, it's just starting out fire in the belly and they're small to mid-sized people who've sort of done good quality work. You ask them for their work samples and you're very clear that you don't need anything fancy. Your need is that this guy who probably doesn't have access to a laptop has only a smartphone with limited data can download something and, you know, uh, in, in just about five seconds and listen to you. If that's your need. Who is the best partner to solve it? And I and I think, you know, uh, LinkedIn today is a great resource to reach out to people. So you don't need to do anything fancy. Uh, all you need to do, but do a good thorough interview of your learning partner or your learning vendor. See if they have the insight of servicing you and walking that extra mile with you. Because I think for me, that has always been the deciding factor of choosing a vendor. You know, the pricing is there is an, is, is an agenda. But yes, but apart from that, how much is he able to walk with you? How much is he able to sort of take your, uh, you know, take your insights and, you know, um, work with what you exactly need? So I think these are the two yeah. things that uh, has worked for me. And I, I always, you know, bet my money with uh, new startup uh, people who've done some great work in, you know, in, in organizations and now have started on their own and not really the big fives all the time because you may not have the resources and maybe that's not what you need. Oh, so if you know sure. what you need, that's that's how you will work backwards to get it. I think um, that's so beautifully put because I think a lot of the times we overbuild capability in our vendor side without realizing whether that's actually what our business needs. Um, you know, so just putting down uh, the very broad objectives that your business requires from a learning intervention becomes really, really critical. Uh, I think somebody earlier mentioned that there are a lot of freemium products that are now available where you can start with using the free version and only adapt to the paid version if it works for you. So I think there are multiple ways that we can actually, um, uh, you know, still expand the way that our virtual footprint works. Uh, you know, I, I actually mentor a, a young company that actually has started building a product that does VR training. And, uh, you know, it's, I was actually shocked that it isn't really expensive but they're really young, they're a startup, they're not going to be perfect. Uh, but you know, that's what, work with your learning partner to help them perfect what they need to do. I think that becomes a really big journey. If you're just going in for a uh, out of the box solution, you're not going to get it cheap. Um, it is going to be a problem. So get innovative how you work with your learning partners. And I think Vidisha put it really well, actually work with them as partners versus vendors. Um, and some closing thoughts from each one of you. Uh, anything for the audience that you think one point that will help them? Nandini? I think I'll just add on to what uh, Pidisha said on the question asked as a you know closing thought. So, uh, you know, there's always this uh, fight between uh, cost versus quality, right? And uh, like she rightly put in, I think what becomes very critical in a you know, learning partner is whether they are flexible and willing to service you as a you know, customer. And I've seen a lot of the bigger partners, you know, uh, they are not so flexible. And on the contrary, like Pidisha rightly put it, the best people to work with are new startups. Uh, people who are, like I said, willing to flex with you and give you certain things which are customized to your requirement. So we work with uh, Microgenesis 
and uh, you know we've uh, come out with this entire career progression for our frontline staff and it has worked beautifully for us and it's extremely extremely uh, pocket friendly you know so i think uh, there were a lot of partners we met and we finally boiled down to them because they were very customer friendly they have completely customized the product for us and they are very very uh you know like i said pocket friendly you know so i think it's very very critical that whatever work you do in the lnod space it becomes very important for you look to you for you to look at how is it benefiting the organization and what is the final outcome that you're expecting from it yeah so if you keep this in yeah. mind i'm sure it's going to help you yeah thank you nandini all right so i'm getting uh, pings big time from uh, minakshi who's saying that we're really over time but i think uh, you know i'm just going to Uh, I apologize, Jeeva Shatanu and Dr. Sanjeev, because uh, I think we won't be able to take the one point. Uh, but uh, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Uh, you've all worked tirelessly during this period with your teams to be able to ensure they stayed on on you know on top of it. I think uh, you know even as we were going through this period with McDonald's, one of the biggest challenges that we saw was keeping people engaged at a time when emotionally. i'm just not being able to cope uh you know and and i think the lnod teams the hr teams have worked double time and harder than i think they've ever had to work um so thank you to all the lnod teams thank you to the hr teams thank you to each one of you for being a fantastic leader um you know and uh, thank you for your feedback this evening um i had a lot of fun i hope you guys did too Thank you so much, Seema. We had a wonderful yeah, thank time. Thank you so much, Seema. Thank you so much for all the panelists. Thanks, Seema. Thank you. All right. Thank you bye -bye. so much. All right. Bye bye. 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 bye.